Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Jan Wojcik from Potsdam. He's a retired faculty from Clarkson University and has been an active member of the North Country Civil War Roundtable for many years now. Given a number of presentations for us on topics as diverse as women in the Civil War, the battles of Spotsylvania and the surrender at Appomattox, the Overland Campaign, Elderkin's Trunk, I can't remember what the last one you did. You did one last year that was very different. And today he is here to do yet another one, which is going to be a very thought-provoking and hopefully a good discussion starter that I'm very curious about on Charles Darwin and how his theories affected both sides of the Civil War. James. And of course, to all of you for coming out on such a day, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, here's the first slide in this Darwin and the Civil War. And it uh, mentions a well-known fact that uh, miraculously these two men were born on the same day at the early part of the 19th century. And both of them uh, had harsh things to say about slavery. Uh, Darwin, great God, how I should like to see the greatest curse on earth, slavery abolished. He uh, was from a famous family who were deeply involved in the abolition of slavery in England um, at the early part of the 19th century. And um, so he grew up in that sort of uh, English abolitionist era. And then Lincoln, who at one point, I think this was at Cooper's Union said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Well, they were born on the same day and they had the same attitudes, but their origins were extremely different. Uh, Darwin comes from a very wealthy family. He's got Wedgwoods in it twice. Uh, his grandfather married a Wedgwood. Those are the people that make all the wonderful pottery. He himself, Charles, married a Wedgwood. So he's raised uh, with good education, good money, and good thought right from the beginning. And there's the replica of Lincoln's house in Kentucky, where he was born, uh, about the same size as Thoreau's cabin. Hard to imagine how a whole family could live in there, but apparently they did. Uh, one other thing they have in common is they were frequently depicted in cartoons as apes, uh, for reasons that we'll get into today. And, uh, they're about the same age there. He's 22, Darwin is, and I think Lincoln is in his early 20s in that particular picture. And uh, the picture that depicts Lincoln as an ape has uh, a little black uh, person with his hat off, jumping up and down, uh, reading the Emancipation Proclamation. And there is the grand ape who has just uh, freed the blacks. That's in a, uh, actually a Northern cartoon a copperhead cartoon. It's not uh, from the South. Is that a photograph of Lincoln? I'm sorry? Is that a photograph of Lincoln? Oh, uh, wait, let me go back. It looks like a photograph, but it's 1820s. Wait a second, let me go back. You're talking about uh, that? Yeah. yeah, that's a photograph. Huh. It can't be the 1820s. So uh, this is the youngest picture I could find of him, and I wanted to have it up against the youngest picture I could find of uh, Darwin's. Um, I think it's just a fantastic drawing. It's just a fantastic drawing, okay. It does look like a photograph and it fooled me. I didn't think that uh, that's probably before photography was good enough to do an image like that. Yeah. Okay. In the revision, that'll be acknowledged. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, here is Lincoln's thinking about race. And this is a very rough sketch that goes over about six to eight years. And my argument here is that this is how Lincoln thinks about race over time. It's a linear longitudinal study. And uh, it starts in 1858 when he in his speech says he opposes Negro equality. And he says that whites, to his mind, are a superior race. Then in 1860, he says, we should allow the humblest man an equal chance, which seems to be suggesting that uh, black people are humans and men. 
In 62, he supports the idea of colonizing free blacks. This was an idea that was widely spread throughout the North because people who were of good mind and thought the slaves should be uh, released from bondage couldn't imagine what could happen to them afterwards. They were uneducated. They didn't know how uh, to perform very many tasks. How would they uh, fit into the society that they would be released into? And um, he was dissuaded from this idea very gradually. And one of the people who dissuaded him was uh, Frederick Douglass, who he, come to, he came to, to call his friend. Well, in 1862, he uh, issued publicly a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, which said that if by the 1st of January, uh, the war is not over, then I am going to emancipate not all the slaves, but simply all of the slaves who are in rebel territory at the time. A very, very uh, slow step forward. And of course, when this was promulgated in the newspapers in the North, in, the, um, uh, in that uh, fall, there was tremendous criticism of this, especially from the Copperhead Press. Of course, the uh, Confederate Press was just absolutely outraged at this. Uh, then he um, issues the exact, uh, well, he issues the Emancipation Proclamation the 1st of January, 1863. And interestingly, what's different from the initial proclamation and the final statement is he adds into it because he's been persuaded from the summer through to the winter that black men should be able to be recruited into the army. This was a controversy, uh, but uh, he decided to resolve it. And what's interesting about this, and I'll make a point, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll go through the whole thing and then uh, I'll make the point. Okay, 64, speaking of blacks, he says, if they stake their lives for us, they must be prompted by the strongest motive, even the promise of freedom and the promise made must be kept. Very interesting. That's advanced. You know, we're moving along. But then in 1864, I was really amazed to discover this. A contingent of people from the Congress came to him and said, we have to start paying black soldiers the same as we pay white soldiers. Because initially, the recruitment seemed to be dependent on a kind of compromise that, yeah, they could serve, but they're going to make less money, significantly less than white soldiers. Well, in the process of greeting this contingent from the Congress, uh, after they tell him what they're there for, he says, oh, we should give the coffees more money and then laughs. And apparently this was a Kentucky slang word for blacks. It was the C word instead of the N word. And interestingly, he was brought up by the congressional delegation uh, for this, saying, you really shouldn't use that term. And he laughed and he said, forgive me, I'm a Southern man and I can't completely give up my pass. But 10 minutes later, he agreed to start paying black soldiers the same amount. I mean, there's a really interesting uh, mental, emotional uh, ambiguity. And then finally, he calls the 13th Amendment, which he manages to get through. If you've seen the movie Lincoln, uh, it's an amazing study of the process that uh, that, that took. It was an amendment that would um, uh, free or banish slavery completely in the United States um, that was first brought forward in uh, 1863. And it was defeated in Congress. It passed in the Senate, but it was defeated in the House. And as the war was winding down, Lincoln realized that uh, this had to be done before the South came back in to the Union and could vote in Congress because they had enough votes to, uh, to stymie it, especially if uh, it was uh, uh, something that required at the time a, a veto-proof uh, uh, majority in the Congress. Well, so he pulls every possible string to get that thing passed uh, at the beginning of 1865. And interestingly, he says about it in an offhand remark, it is the king's cure for all evil, evils. 
And uh, that's a very interesting phrase. It turned out that at the time there was a popular medicine called the King's Cure that was made out of primrose oil. And it claimed to cure everything, just about. You know, you rub it on your head, your hair grows, you take it, your cough goes away. Uh, kind of a quack medicine of the day. But the term had apparently been taken over by the company that sold this stuff uh, from a term that had been used uh, in uh, several centuries earlier to refer to the divine right of kings extending, it was thought, to the king having the power to cure evils by simply touching people. And uh, I don't know whether this was tested much scientifically, but anyway, the, uh, the, um, the word was out that uh, the king's cure would uh, cure all evil. So he's referring both maybe to that, but he's also referring to this quack medicine. It's kind of a joke, but it turns out there's another interesting uh, meaning for uh, the king's cure. And that is at about the time of Shakespeare it was considered a way to solve a political problem, say you're having with a village. The king's cure is you come in, you kill everybody. That solves the problem. Okay, that, that's the king's cure. Uh, so, well, in, in a way, all three of these are really sort of appropriate, however he meant them. All right, well, what I'm saying is that there's an evolution here in the way he thinks and the way he talks. And it's, it's an uneven one. It's, it's not a rising trajectory. It also is a measure of thinking in the North because he only can say and do these things because the political will slowly builds behind him. And the difference between the reaction in the North between the initial uh, Emancipation Proclamation and that which came out in January was very, very different. There was a lot of resistance to it in the summer, but by the winter, he had brought them around. So this is an evolution of his thinking and the thinking in the North. And I want you to just hold that in mind, that uh, kind of change over time, as we now look at uh, the Darwinian part of today's program. Well, here he is at 22, after finishing an undergraduate degree. And uh, he is planning to study theology. He's going to become a pastor. That's what he thought he was going to be. And interestingly, the kind of theology that uh, he was uh, intent upon in his day was called natural theology. If you know the movie Gettysburg, there's one moment when Colonel um, Chamberlain is asked by his immediate superior, who uh, was a full colonel, who was a professor at Harvard, uh, he asked Colonel Chamberlain, who was a professor at Bowdoin College, uh, what was it that you taught while you were a professor? And he said, natural, the he said, theology, both natural and revealed. And revealed is the kind of stuff that you find in the scripture uh, that you have to interpret. But natural was the theology of England in the early part of the 19th century that was the result of uh, folks uh, who thought a lot, being aware of all the new developments in science that were going on, especially geology, that were showing that the earth could not have been created in seven days. It was created over an immense long period of time. And um, so the thought was then as a way to keep uh, belief in God possible as these uh, attacks, you might say, on uh, literal interpretations of the scripture was to say, well, look, the universe is absolutely beautiful and fascinating and science keeps telling us how intricate it is, how beautiful it is, and that's the way God is. You know, we, we study that and we discover the capacities of God. So that was the kind of theology that he was preparing himself in. And he had a chance to go on uh, the Beagle, which was uh, one of the boats that the British government was sending out in the early part of the 19th century to chart the oceans of the world, to find out where the currents were, where the danger parts were, because the English were in the process of building a mercantile empire that was going to be sending their mercantile ships all over the world. And they wanted to have maps 
that told him where to go, how to go, what was the best and fastest way to go. And um, he got a job as a naturalist on this boat that was actually more on a military uh, expedition. It was gone for five years. He would have a chance to go ashore whenever they were at a place where you could go ashore and study the life that was there at his part of his um, uh, hope eventually to become a uh, natural theologian as well as a pastor. Well, The Voyage of the Beagle is the book he publishes about his adventures, and it's published early in the 1850s and uh, very, very popular. Uh, Henry David Thoreau read it. Uh, it's mentioned in Walden several times. Um, he is on this ship when it stops at the Galapagos Islands off the coast of uh, South America. And there's a picture there of the Galapagos Islands. They're scattered in the Pacific Ocean. And the islands are far enough away so that the life on each one of them more or less develops independently of life on the others. They're far enough away so that they don't have animals or birds or, or amphibians that are inter mating with one another. They're, they're isolated in um, their development. And uh, there's a, a picture of the beagle showing up. Um, I think this is a Tierra del Fuego, del Fuego, one of the places they stop on the way. Well, he goes ashore and they're there for a long time because it's very complicated currents among all of these islands. And what he discovers by going from island to island to island is that the finches have different beaks and that on each island, the same basic finch over time and a long period of time, like maybe a million years, he doesn't know this, but that's how long it really took, would start to develop beaks that were most appropriate for harvesting the food that would be available on one island as opposed to another. And you can see, and this particular sketch has in the background the various Galapagos Islands, and then you have bird beaks and <coughs> By the bird beak is the kind of food that that beak enabled the bird to eat. And so what Darwin began to extrapolate from this was that over time, as an environment would change, those members of a species who could adapt along with it would start to physically change. And at a certain particular point, a new species would form. Okay, hold on to that one just for a second. Um, here's a couple of things that are like what he was talking about, but not quite completely like what he's talking about. And we'll see the difference in a second. This is dog breeding, all right? One of the things that uh, he did when he got back to England is he went and he talked to animal breeders. He said, how do you do this? What's the mechanism? How do you know what to try? Uh, how do you select afterwards? He wanted to know that mechanism, even though this mechanism is certainly under the control of a single mind, you know, that of the breeder. But he said, how do you do this? How does it happen? And as it turns out, right here is uh, my dog, or Christine and my dog, uh, BD, uh, the dog. This is a, uh, And it is amazing when you look at this incredible array here, and they're all from wolves. Well, although they all look very different, this is not a new species group. All these animals can interbreed with one another and produce fertile offspring. That's the critical definition of what a species is. So I don't know how this guy's gonna do it with a wolf, but uh, you know, those that were appropriately sized uh, could do it. And he also went to pigeon breeders who had a hobby in England of taking your regular rock pigeon there at the top that flies all around in the cities and selecting, selecting, selecting and getting very fancy uh, pigeons. How do you do this? What's going on here? All right. And here is all, bang, it. This is all the origin of species really says. And uh, would you like to read it? Yeah. Eventually, the changes in the bodies of the survivors culminate in the creation of a new species. A species is a group of indivi individuals who can mate with each other and produce fertile offspring. 
Uh, for example, a mule is sterile, a tomato is fertile. Or a mutt is fertile. I mean, different breeds of dogs create mutts, which in many cases are healthier and uh, more vigorous than uh, the dogs from the breeds of uh, their parents. Well, here are a couple of other uh, like illustrations. I'll go through these rather quickly. Let's say you've got an animal like an early giraffe that's got a short neck, but all of a sudden all the short plants die out for some reason. Only the tall plants are uh, edible. It's only the giraffes that happen to be born with slightly longer necks that are going to uh, survive and then breed and make the necks get bigger. The Lamarckian view of this was, well, they would stretch their necks and they would pass the stretching on, but that's not exactly the process. The process is a, geneti a genetic mutation that selects certain individuals that have it, that make them more appropriate participants in the environment they find themselves in. And here's another uh, simple little sketch. There you can see uh, step one, a mama elephant with a short trunk. Is that out of focus a little? Yeah, yeah. it is. Oh, I thought it was my eyes. <laughs> 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 it's really my glasses, but it's <laughs> was, was it always on out of focus? Ah, yeah. oh, why didn't you say something? Ah, oh. how did you manage to read it out of focus? He's young. He's young. <laughs> Huh? I thought I was a sleepy one. Ah, oh, gee. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mamie. That was a, a brilliant touch there. Okay. Anyway, so now you can much better see the mama elephant here has a short trunk. Her baby's got a long one. Uh, the long, the short trunked elephants die out because they don't get the food quite as efficiently. The little babies with the long trunks grow up and then they become the breeding stock for all the elephants who from this point on have a... Uh, longer trunk. Now here's another thing which is like the selection, uh, natural selection that he's talking about, although it's not quite it. This is a fascinating experiment. It's been going on in first Soviet Russia, now in Russia since uh, 1959. And it's a man, Dmitry Belayev, who has been breeding foxes and uh, on a fur farm. And initially he was there to try to improve the breeding so they'd get more fur. But what he began to do on the side was he would take 20% of the foxes at any given time who were the most friendly to human beings. And he would separate them out and he would allow them only to breed with themselves. And then after a generation or so, he would select the 20% of those who were the most friendly. And what he discovered amazingly was that over time, foxes started to look like dogs. That they, their color changed, their ears would flop, all right? Because these random things were happening and uh, nature wasn't selecting against them. I mean, floppy ears don't hear quite so well, but a domesticated fox doesn't have to hear so well, so the occasional floppy one could uh, survive to pass those genes on. Uh, so there's the fox they start with, and there's a couple of foxes that they get to. Now, once again, this isn't quite yet the creation of species because all of these animals can interbreed if they're allowed. They're not in, allowed in the uh, experiment that this guy is running. But isn't that amazing? And he wasn't, he was actually thinking about Darwin when he did this experiment, started it. Uh, but mainly he was interested in how did wolves become domesticated? How did dogs come out of wolves? And that process went on for several thousand years just with wolves showing up and only the friendly ones being allowed to stay. Okay, now here are a couple of other uh, noticeable examples of this. Once again, just short of species change. This is the pepper moth. And you might have seen this described before. In England, during the 19th century, everybody was burning coal. And so the whole city turned black. And it turned out that the pepper moth, uh, which you see uh, in its normal state on the top there, uh, gradually turned black so that the moth, when it was up against a black building, couldn't be seen so easily by its predators. As England in the 20th century began to clean up their act, the buildings went white again and the moth went white again, okay? 
very quickly, not enough, again, of a change to make a species change, but um, uh, fascinating in uh, the illustration that you can see with your own eyes of uh, how this process would begin. And this is a really interesting picture here because here's a dark one and here's a light one. And the dark one is close to this and the light one is in the light. So uh, one of them is better adapted to being in the sunlight and this one to be, uh, to be in the shade. All right, Darwin's book, Origin of the Species, gets to the United States in 1859. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. And what's amazing is the thing that most captures people's imagination is his calling this process of adaptation the survival of the fittest, okay? Um, or the struggle for existence. Words that seem to suggest violence, whereas this process is not violent at all. It takes place very quietly over enormous amounts of time. Anyway, they really thought that was very interesting, that scientifically a struggle to survive was normal, all right? And both sides actually thought this gave them kind of scientific permission to kill each other. Mm -hmm. You know, if this is an important idea, keep black slaves, no, let them go. We'll fight and see who wins because nobody's going to back down, uh, which isn't at all what Darwin was ever saying. But wow, was that interesting. Here is more what Darwin was really saying. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And there's a little flower or a little plant growing in a crack in a wall. That's the survival of the species. That's evolution. That's uh, um, OK. Or to put it another way, I know I'm hammering this kind of hard. In Darwin's struggle for existence, the struggle is not between the cheetah and the antelope. It's between the two antelopes. You got it? You know, one's faster than the other one. So those are the ones he's going to survive. She's going to survive to have the babies. All right. Well, Darwin comes up with this theory. He doesn't publish it until 1859. But he comes up with the theory in the late 30s and early 40s. And he works and he works and he works on this because he is very frightened at what the implications seem to be of what his theory is suggesting beyond the bare minimum of that uh, biological process that uh, we were describing earlier. Um, there at the top is a picture of kind of the ideal creation in the minds of lots of people, uh, a biblical a world where all the species are created at the same time. They all live in a kind of harmony. Uh, there's Adam and Eve there in the middle. I think you can see them. And uh, they're here, I think. Is that right? Yeah. And Adam, of course, is about to get the apple. And uh, we're going to result <laughs> from all that. By the way, do you know why it's an apple? The Bible or Genesis doesn't use the word apple. It just uses the word uh, fruit. Well, it turned out that in Latin, which is what a lot of people read the Bible in, uh, the word for apple, malum, is the same word that's used for evil, malum. And so the idea was, well, malum must be a bad fruit. It must be the apple. Well, you know, if nothing else, you can remember that. that you, <laughs> you learned that today. All right. Um, and uh, to show you how strong these ideas are, about the uh, literal uh, meaning of the scriptures, that picture on the bottom is the ark that is being built or is now completed in a creationist theme park in Kentucky. All right, I mean, these ideas are deeply embedded in the way a lot of people think. And um, so all of a sudden, he's got these ideas that uh, seem to shake that. Here are just 
uh, some suggestions of what the implications of his theory is. That there was no simultaneous creation, no providential design. However this thing started, nobody was there saying, well, this is where we're going to go. Finally, we're going to have, you know, this kind of a superior being. No, it just happens uh, by random selection. Okay. No special place in nature for human. We've done very well for ourselves. We have to grant that. But not because we were put here in some special place. And finally, and this is the most dangerous implication, there is no providential plan. And you might wonder why I've got that symbol up there. Well, that's alpha and omega. That's the idea that there's an alpha at the beginning of the Greek alphabet. There's an omega at the end of the Greek alphabet. And all of life is on this kind of curve. We start here. Providence is guiding it to end here, where finally the heavens will be opened. And all of the people in this audience will go to heaven. And the people who couldn't make it today, <laughs> some of them, some of them won't go to heaven. All right. Well, okay. Uh, now back to Darwin <laughs> and uh, how we can tie him into the Civil War. His book arrives the same week that John Brown is hung. Isn't that interesting? All right. So the North and the South are thinking of nothing but your, uh, John Brown at this point. The South is saying it's hopeless. You know, they're just going to keep making more John Browns up there. It's over. We've got to go to war. And the North is saying, this is a critical moment. Uh, this guy finally had the courage to do what we all really should have been doing for a long time, really starting to do something. I mean, break the ice, get this thing moving. And the origin of the species shows up the same week. Very interesting. Here's another thing that shows up the same week. There was a Barnum-like uh, uh, character from France uh, named Paul du Cailloux, who uh, had been looking at gorillas and apes in Africa for a couple of decades. And then he decided he could make a lot of money if he shot some of these things, stuffed them, and started to bring them around and show them to the public. You know, this is what, uh, you know, there actually are these things out there. And for many people, uh, his stuffed gorillas, which arrived in the United States along with him, who's setting up this thing, Peggy Nickley, you can come in and see the gorilla. Um, I, I can't remember how I'm going to end this sentence. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, <laughs> anyway, the, the sideshow comes in. Uh, with uh, stuffed gorillas, and that's a cart contemporary cartoon from uh, Punch about his, uh, his show in Britain. All right, now between 1859 and 1861, uh, Southern media, as it is uh, more intensely frightened about what is ominously in the air, begin to publish more and more books and uh, editorials and pamphlets arguing that blacks are inferior, that uh, it is a very natural thing for us to domesticate them, just like it is for us to domesticate cattle and dogs. And um, the emotional support, support for um, uh, Brown is, as I said, suggesting that the, um, that the uh, opposite is true. Well, here on the <coughs> upper left-hand corner, is a slave-holding family in Virginia in the late 1850s. They look ordinary. They don't look like your uh, kind of pompous uh, plantation owners. They're just a, a working farm family, but they own slaves. And there's the slaves, not that they own necessarily, but the kinds of people that were enslaved at the time. And what they could do is they could look at themselves and see how nicely dressed they were, how clean they were, how healthy they were. And they could look then down uh, at the blacks that they had enslaved and see such 
awful looking people, dirty, messy, they smelled and stuff. And so they were constantly seeing in their own minds reinforcements for their ideas. Well, finally, of course, the South secedes. And um, in so doing, all of the states wrote constitutions and that seceded. And the um, Confederacy wrote a constitution for all of them. And each one of them mentioned slavery by name. The uh, US Constitution does not mention slaves by name, uh, but uh, the Southern ones did. And uh, there is the line that says this in the Confederate Constitution, the institution of Negro slavery as it exists in the Confederate States shall be recognized and protected by Congress, the Confederate Congress. And here is a little broadside from uh, Stevens, who's the first vice president of the Confederacy, who says, this stone slavery, which was rejected by the first builders, the North, has become the chief stone of the corner in our new edifice. I mean, they're, they're, uh, it, you know, they're really gripping this thing. So anybody who ever tells you that the Civil War was not about slavery, have them read that. <laughs> You know, this is right at the beginning. Anyway, here's John Calhoun, who uh, just had his name stripped from a college at Yale uh, because he wrote this kind of stuff a couple hundred years ago, and they decided they didn't want to have his name anymore around. He said, never before has the black race of Central Africa, from the dawn of history to the present day, attained a condition so civilized and so improved, not only physically, but morally and intellectually. Okay. Now, now I'm going to make as strong a plea as I think can be made for the influence of the Darwinian idea of the creation of species on the thinking that goes behind the North's participation in the Civil War. Here is one of my cultural heroes, a man named Ozzie Gray, a biologist and a naturalist at Harvard. He was the first person in the United States to read a copy of The Origin of Species. He was a good friend of Darwin's. Darwin sent him an actual English um, edition of the book that was, had been published earlier in England um, so that he got it at the same time that the, um, that the, uh, uh, the American public was able to get it over here. But he was the first one to read it. And there's this wonderful book called um, what is it called? I can't remember. By Randall, uh, you just read it. Randall, Randall Fuller, The Book That Changed the Way America Thought. Uh, a great book. Um, and I should have a picture of it to show you, but I don't. Um, anyway, uh, he traces, Randall Fuller does, this particular copy. First it goes to uh, Asa Gray, then it goes to uh, Loring Brace, then it goes to eventually Thoreau. I mean, he's like the third or fourth person in the United States to read this particular copy. Now, here is what he uh, gets into the public consciousness about this book. He writes four essays in the Atlantic Monthly, a very popular periodical of the day. Uh, that over uh, the time between the January of uh, 1860 and uh, the winter of 1861 digests the meaning of the origin of species for the popular mind. And uh, there's actually what the cover of that magazine looked like at the time. And there's the page <laughs> from it. Uh, for whatever it's worth. You can't read it, but there's the page uh, in which he says the following things. And I am emphasizing, um, uh, this isn't working too well, uh, but at any rate, uh, okay, why don't, Carl, why don't you read that? My voice is uh, wearing out, the top one anyway. Can you read that pretty well? No doubt the full depth of development and symmetry on Darwin's hypothesis strongly suggests that evolution of the human no less than the lower animal races out of some simple primordial animal that that all are equal literal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the I'm, 
Silurian. Silurian system, what was deposited. Okay, so notice that what he's doing here is he's suggesting that what Darwin is really saying is we're all related to everything that's natural. He himself doesn't publish until 1871 a book called The Descent of Man, wherein he does apply the theory to uh, the thought that uh, primates are our earliest ancestors. And there's a lot of different kinds, and it's only a certain kind that actually evolved into Homo sapiens. It's only an implication in the first book that's not really said uh, directly until the second, and he's picking up on that. And um, here's another thing that uh, uh, Isaac Gray is picking up on. He says at the bottom of uh, the page, and I've highlighted it a little bit, as we said at the beginning, this upshot decomposes us, discomposes us. Several features of the theory have an uncanny look. They may prove to be innocent, but their first aspect is suspicious, and high authorities pronounce the whole thing to be positively mischievous. Then he says, in one stunning phrase, Darwin has basically told us everything we know, we think we know, is wrong. He just flips everything. You know, <laughs> that's pretty heavy duty stuff uh, to say that. Okay. Okay, that, that's right. Here is a marvelous. Uh, computer-generated picture of Darwin by a uh, computer artist named David Ravoy, who uh, designs video games and uh, uh, cartoons. Uh, isn't that a great picture of him <laughs> with all these little animals in it and uh, what for, so forth? Um, and um, here he is, um, here is his, the father of this uh, kind of uh, art, uh, Giuseppe Acremboldo, uh, who uh, 500 years ago was uh, making art like this, where he was uh, making human heads out of uh, vegetables. Uh, just, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Here is my thesis. What I'm saying is that Isaac Gray got these ideas out. The abolitionists were among the intellectual set that read all of these essays that Isaac Gray wrote. All of them began to say, this is the first scientific proof that blacks and whites are indeed of the same species, the ultimate proof of which is the fact that there are such things as mulattoes who are fertile. You know, there are black and white offspring who uh, produce other offspring, all right? So the first sign thing, but of course, who listened to abolitionists? They were a small persnickety group of people, always agitating, always getting everybody upset. Even Lincoln was annoyed with them many a time. But what the abolitionists did is they kept hammering on this idea of abolition, um, abolition. Uh, all through the run-up to and during the Civil War. And what they do in the process is they disseminate this idea of the need to uh, liberate the blacks and to recognize them as equal human beings. That, I think, we saw developed in Lincoln's thinking through the Civil War. So all I can really claim is that the abolitionists grabbed this idea they disseminated it the way they could, and it must have had an effect because the Union changed the way it was thinking, consistent with the Darwinian idea that we're all connected. Okay? That's all I can claim. And here's my argument. I think that what the Civil War was about was an argument between two sides. One side said, we will not think. And the other side said, we will think. Th 
thinking isn't beautiful. It's not grabbing an idea that's better than another idea. It's a slow, painful process that finally works its way to an understanding. And the Union did that, and the South did not. How about that? Is that okay? That's the origin of the Civil War. It's a, it's a fight between the non-thinkers and the thinkers. Okay, now, I have a little treat for you. We're going to look at a couple of clips from the marvelous movie Gettysburg, which is based on the marvelous novel Killer Angels. And uh, we are going to have two members of the Bolt family do a reading of one of the dialogues between two soldiers on the Union side. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a clip on this taken right from the movie itself. Am I doing the wrong things? No, okay. Um, of, of an argument that's going on at the same time uh, on the Confederate side in the movie. And this movie is about Gettysburg, of course. And all of these men the next day are going to be fighting on the second day of the battle. And many of the Confederate generals who are laughing and talking and having a good time are going to be killed uh, two days later uh, at the uh, uh, Pickens, uh, Pickens, Pickett's, yes. Pickett's Charge. Okay. But before we do that, let's have some questions. Let's relax. Let's think. Let's walk over. Let's eat. Go ahead, sir. Wait. Wait, I'm going to... This, uh, this is being recorded. All right. And the only way to make sure that your question winds up being recorded is if you speak... Okay, we'll speak into this, though. Now, this is just my opinion. Okay, go ahead. Many construing abolitionists with people who thought blacks were evil right. did not always go side by side. Right. Until people from the North really didn't know them or were associated with the black race. Right. It wasn't until they were in the service and they showed what they could do in uniform, changed and is documented many times, the white officers would come away with a different attitude. And I think it was that attitude change sent back home in letters, in documentation, that helped change that change, make that change possible. You're absolutely right, and that is consistent with my idea that thinking is like the tide rising. Uh, it's very slow and gradual, and a lot of things get mixed into it. But you're absolutely right, and there are many very powerful statements made by white officers uh, coming to this realization of the common humanity that they s shared with these people, and that was behind the uh, insistence in the... Uh, Congress that they be given equal pay. Uh, could you? Okay, you have the mic. Uh, uh, Andrew, we're going to give the mic to you in just a minute. Uh, you have a comment there, sir. Um, actually, I have about 10. You got 10 comments, right. okay. <laughs> First of all, I find it pretty ironic that the abolitionists who were mainly coming out of religious circles were the ones embracing Darwin's That's right. approach, which is kind of ironic considering what he was saying on that. Um, also, I was since you mentioned the uh, uh, Lincoln movie, which was based largely on uh, Goodman's book, The uh, Team of Rivals, uh, the book is so much better than the movie, <laughs> first of all. Um, but also, I think there's an element in there that it comes across, it doesn't come across in the movie, uh, regarding specifically that timeline of Lincoln's thinking. What he was thinking and what he expressed publicly were often two different things. And he was deliberate. He was very self-conscious about trying to make and you know, cause, bring about the change in public opinion that would allow him then to act on what he had been thinking earlier. So often his his thinking on that was evolving, but it was much in advance of when he actually made these particular statements. I think, and even when he says the most, you know, caustic comments, it wasn't really an expression of his what he really thought about the people, you know. He, he did think there was a difference in the races, but 
at no point did he really think that you know slavery was legitimate or they should be you know ridiculed or put down and even his use of what would be considered you know uh, harsh language against them would not have been done in a mean-spirited way you know which is why you can laugh about it um, I really like the remark you made about the the central role of the work being about the thinking versus the non-thinking. I think that's really a beautiful uh, representation. But at some point, we need to have a discussion about the economics of it. Oh, it, yeah, sure. You know, so that it being about, about uh, slavery, that I, in my opinion, while slavery was a role in it, it, it wasn't so much about the slavery itself, but slavery as it was a, a symptom of a bigger disease of an economic problem that we, frankly, still have not solved. and uh, and. You know, the more I try to clarify that, looking back at the founding fathers, the more you see that the the, the deepness of the rift at that point on that question was was really more profound. Very astute, and uh, what you're referring to is the fact that the greatest amount of capital in the United States before the Civil War was invested in black slaves. I think, or maybe. Uh, it was real estate, but those were the two greatest uh, uh, piles of wealth that there was. So the idea of giving the slaves up as an economic asset was completely bewildering to anybody who thought about this issue at all. And certainly economics is really driving and, it. And the idea of that, what you're just saying, representing a mis misplaced idea of what value was was demonstrated in the Civil War in the fact that there was no way for the, the, the South to turn what they considered wealth into an effective war machine over time, where the North actually grew during that period of time because the placement of value on infrastructure and planting equipment and physical, physically building things, innovation, technology, and all those things that gives a much better identity, or human identity, versus the, the racial stuff. Um, and, and really, again, that's the economic issue that's not solved. Right, uh, well said, again. And one could argue that um, the most liberal time in American politics was uh, in the North during the Civil War, because the South wasn't there to mess things up anymore. And so Lincoln could start the land-grant college system. Uh, with the Morrill Act. He could get the railroad built. Uh, there wasn't any argument anymore of whether it was going to go through the south or the north. It was going to go through the north. And so an incredible number of things happened, including uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, because the south wasn't there to muck it up. Yeah. And this is a Yankee talking, I guess, here. Sure is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, perhaps you have a comment after uh, Andrew here. Yeah, I, I just uh, have a question about Abraham Lincoln. Is, is it possible that he thought of the blacks as still technically human, but just lingering a stage or two behind in evolution? So therefore, the, the whites were a step above them in terms of intellect, but the blacks were, you know, going to catch up eventually. And so therefore, they should be freed and allowed to do so, but should be separated from the white and still superior society, even though, you, you know, today, a lot of us know better these days. Some of us. Um, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, a, a very good question, and one that I really c can't answer on the basis of what I did for this talk or the knowledge I have of Lincoln. That's a very subtle question that would uh, require sifting through everything that he was thinking and actually saying right up until the end. I did a much cruder sketch. Uh, but what I am saying is whatever his thought was, the actions spoke volumes about a gradual sense that 
Whatever this is going to mean for us, we don't know how we're going to deal with all of the consequences of it, but they're human beings like us. Uh, they deserve everything that uh, we deserve. Could I say, I think Frederick Douglass is also at that time period was a very important ad advocate for equality. That's right, that's and true. Not so much uh, slavery and equality are two different things. That's true. And in fact, Lincoln at one point says publicly when he sees Douglas in a reception line, ah, here is my friend, Mr. Douglas, uh, which he did, it seemed, as a sign to anybody listening and recording this, that he was accepting uh, what uh, Frederick Douglass stood for. Yeah, uh, this is totally anecdotal, but uh, my, one of my sons married into a Southern family. Uh, in Virginia. <laughs> and um, I have spent the night at the family manse where there were slave buildings still outside used as sheds. And uh, while I was doing that, I, I found in a drawer a, uh, a um, racist, stupid, doggerel poem written by one of their family members <coughs> about just that about inviting apes into the White House and how awful this was. I was just stunned by this. I mean, it was typed up. So I told the family that I had found this and there was no interest in it. It's still in the drawer. <laughs> it's a very bad poem, but wow, was that amazing. I mean, this guy really was angry. Well, um, I can't really trace it subtly, uh, as what your question is almost asking someone to do. All I can say is a huge body of thought changes over five years based on what Lincoln says and what Lincoln does, and that part of the mix is the persnickety ideas of the abolitionists, who had plenty of ideas about black emancipation before Darwin's book came along. This was just a little added layer of urgency to their arguments that they gained from it. And um, that at no time does Lincoln ever speak for the entire North. He only speaks for 51% needed to get this piece of legislation passed or not. Um, so I'm making a, a rather limited claim uh, but um, there are books, and as I kind of came to understand what I was going to do today, I realized I, in a way, should go back and read them again, that talk about the influence that the abolitionists had uh, with the thesis that they really did change the North very, very slowly and just enough for an adept politician like Lincoln was to manipulate popular opinion uh, to the advantage of the blacks. Again, sir. I think one of the, one of the, again, my opinion, one of the advantages the abolitionists had was that they did not do this on their own. They joined with temperance organizations. They joined with religious organizations. They worked as a consortium so that that gave them more power more voice, 
spread the news. They may not agree on everything, but they had similar beliefs that all came together and helped promote this idea. That's true. And I could add at this point that Asa Gray, my intellectual hero, uh, the man who did disseminate his ideas, uh, Darwin's ideas into the American consciousness, himself could not give up the idea of an intelligent God behind the brilliance of creation. And late in life, an exchange of letters between Asa Gray and Dar Darwin, who were friends and colleagues, had Darwin expressing his sadness that Asa Gray could not make that move, that he could not give up the idea of providential design. And Asa Gray saying, I can't. And so he himself, as an abolitionist and a very bright man who understood like nobody else did what Darwin was doing, couldn't give up all of the past. Sir. Okay, I want you to take these comments as they're given as a form of argument, not an attack on you personally. Okay, fine, sure. That's the whole point of thinking is to do that. Southerners can't think, and Northerners can't. Ah, uh, wait, wait, wait. I only said thinking about slavery. Okay. Okay. Southerners can't think about slavery, and Northerners can't. That's right. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So that leads me to ask two questions. Why didn't he leave in 1491? And why did an Italian sail for Spain? The discovery of the island of Madeira led to ships tripling in size for Spain. And so those tiny ships you see sailing into the harbor were the largest in the world by three times. Fast forward to the Civil War. What you're leaving out of this equation is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was fought for, or the Civil War was fought for opportunistic reasons. The now industrializing North was going to need food or it would be in an impossible political position. Simultaneously, slavery disappeared all around the world within 30 years, in some places, without a shot fired. Why? Steam tractors. Technology itself destroyed slavery. Lincoln was nothing more than an opportunistic politician. He managed to get his face on the money, and frankly, that's the best use I had. <laughs> um, okay, if, if you're done, I, I agree with everything you just said. So there's no argument. I mean, I think that indeed it is a, an industrial revolution and blacks are needed eventually in the factories of Michigan. Uh, they, they're much better working there for low wages than they are as slaves. Okay, but still in order to bring that about, one of the steps is we have to end the dependency of our country on this kind of capitalization. And that requires us to begin thinking along the lines of people who have been saying all along, it's wrong to have this kind of capitalization for moral and religious grounds. So you're willing to take these ideas and get them, like you're suggesting Lincoln did, to make, make practical changes in the way the nation worked. You're making an assumption of democracy. Okay. This is not a country that's run by the people. This is a country that's run by a very specific few wealthy, powerful people. Well, What's then to? Yes, that is true. Before you mention the term capitalism. <laughs> now that is, that is true. Uh, but, um, I once had a friend, uh, <laughs> I once had a friend when I was in graduate school who came from Poland and uh, he just um, um, came to the United States 
never having done anything, uh, right out of Poland. I mean, he was just a complete babes in arms, and this was in the late 60s. And he kept telling me about the, the Jewish uh, Bolshevik um, cabal that ran everything in the world. Uh, that uh, none of us had any control of everything. It was the Jews and the Bolsheviks that, that did everything. This was a kind of typical Polish prejudice that I saw in my own family uh, earlier on. So at one point when he was ranting and raving about this, I said, well, how do you think those guys who were running it, you know, the Jews and the Bolsheviks, how do you think it's going? And uh, he said, well, I don't think they think it's going very well at all. And I said, see, we do have an effect <laughs> and we got, you know, politicians today that are doing things that many people here don't like. And the many people here who don't like it do things that cause those politicians sometimes to change. It's not beautiful. It's not serene. But things change over time. We now have liberated women, liberated people of all colors. Okay, they still got problems, but they're a lot better off than they were 150 years ago. I mean, the women don't kill us. The idea of inclusion doesn't kill us. I see. The idea of inclusion was a painful idea in the time of oppression. That's true. Why is slavery not mentioned in the Constitution? Because it is, as Roman Chomsky points out, a weakly worded document intended to bring Virginia in. Virginia, then essentially a wholly owned property of Thomas Jefferson. A okay, let me end this section, take a break, and then we'll have our dramatic presentation here. Uh, oh, okay, uh, I won't end it. Okay, wait, so I'm, I'm to answer what he said. I was going to answer what he said. Now I can't remember what he said. What did he say so that I can answer him? Slavery not mentioned in the Constitution. Oh, it's not, okay, well, one could argue that the Constitution was the first voice in an argument uh, that the Civil War eventually resolves. In a roundabout way, it's uh, mentioned. Well, it is mentioned like the three-fifths rule and all of that. And an importation of slaves is banned. Right. That's, well, that's true. Okay, I'd have to agree. And the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement has told us that it is not a resolved question. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, sir. Oh, I think Andrew had a mic. Oh, Andrew had a mic. Okay, go ahead. I also wanted to respond to the man's comment about industry, that that was going to eventually result in the emancipation of the slaves. I disagree. I say that industry could have also evolved into more a greater dependence on slavery because look at the invention of the cotton gin that resulted in a greater ability to you know process cotton which led to a greater demand for cotton because now it could be afforded more broadly and at a cheaper price and hey, more people needed needed it and it needed to be grown more rapidly and easier. What better way to do that than with slavery? And that therefore it evolved out of an invention and look at industry also it could have just as easily evolved into slave labor because after the civil war look at the result of industry on society C um, cities were highly polluted they were vastly overcrowded, workers were treated as poorly as possible, and 
exploit it as greatly as possible with a result of, hey, you're not property. Do what you want to do. Slavery is illegal now. What was referred to at the time as wage slavery. Right. And therefore, I'd say that industry could have just as easily resulted in a greater demand for slave labor as opposed to abolitionism. The, it was the, renamed. It was no longer black slavery. Okay, well, the only argument I can make against what you just said, um, uh, Andrew, is it did not happen. Right. It could have, but it didn't. Sir? Sir? It did happen. In the South. Ah. Uh, the, 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 prison, the prisons and the institutions down there yep. were selling, for, for lack of a better term, they may use a different term, but they were selling black prisoners to work in private industry for little or no money. My last, they're, they're served, they're, my last, they're my last, dominance. my last slide, okay. Things haven't changed. No. They have, but not completely. I mean, there was a lot of outrage in the South. That picture is taken from the uprising at Charlottesville. Um, and I was just like, you know, months ago or a year ago. Uh, but there's a lot of people in the South that uh, don't support that. So we're not saying that this idea triumphs universally. We're just saying that it's active and it's working. It's bubbling in the mix. And I agree with you on that. What I'm saying is, though, to use the term that we did not have slave labor, it was, in effect, slave labor working in these factories. If they died, while doing these hazardous materials in these chemical companies in the South, in a, probably in the North as well, they weren't treated with respect. They were, they were buried somewhere, forgot about it, written off the books, and it's been documented. Rockefeller himself said that. Why don't you build the railroads as slaves? Slaves cost money. No one cares when an Irishman dies. Okay, well, my response to this is, this is the end, okay, of this part, okay. No, 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 it's all right, it's fine. Uh, here's the end. We now have, and this is going to be a word that will cause many of you in this room to bridle. We now have OSHA. Okay? I mean, we, we, we have institutions which look after the health of workers. Is it a good institution? Does it do everything perfectly right? No. But is it not in existence in order to keep the poor Irish immigrant from falling over dead because of the gases? Yes, but we still also have remnants of this original three fifths part of the Constitution in the Electoral College. It's not popular opinion. OSHA is a crux to help a failing system continue. Of course. My point. I would argue that we are not the most evolved species, that Darwin was dead wrong, because we are the ones that are essentially killing ourselves he, a great deal of the planet. He does not say that we are the most evolved species. He says we are the most evolved primates. He specifically said that a horseshoe crab is just as evolved as we are. Well, <laughs> right, Horseshoe Crab's got a whole different bunch of things that it does. <laughs> None of which we could do, by the way. We can't live underwater and mate with other Horseshoe Crabs. But, <laughs> okay, what a wonderful group you are. Uh, what a wonderful group you are. <laughs> Circulate among yourselves, uh, but don't go away because, in a way, the best part of the program is yet to come. I'm not talking, others are. Okay. Just putting a piece of paper. With, uh, okay. Okay. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at two little clips taken, as I said, from the movie Gettysburg, which is based on the wonderful novel Killer Angels. And uh, one deals with a discussion which is about evolution or black equality on the north side and the south side. 
And I want to show you the south side first. Both of these conversations are going on in the time of the movie simultaneously on the evening of the second day, all right? And um, this is the southern one. And uh, I have this in a clip which I got off the internet. And our technology is not the most wonderful. Listen very closely. Um, and if it doesn't come across the first time, uh, I can play it again. It doesn't last more than a few minutes. Here are, uh, just let me uh, help uh, introduce you to the characters you're going to see. This is Louis Armistead. He's a Brigadier General. He's going to die in Pickett's Charge. Uh, this is uh, Richard, I can't think of his last name. He is a man, when you see him get up, uh, he's crippled. And uh, he is going to be in Pickett's Charge too. And he's going to insist, although he can't walk anymore, that he be a part of the charge. And so he goes on a horse, which ensures that he will be killed. And he knows that. So these two will die. This is Pickett himself, man playing Pickett. And uh, he will survive the war um, doing many stupid things. Um, uh, he's not really responsible for Pickett's charge uh, because he's ordered to do it. And he thinks it's going to work. Um, this is a political general from the Confederacy who is going to be very badly wounded in Pickett's charge because these three are the brigade commanders of Pickett. And what you're going to see is an argument that they're having about Darwin. And then uh, uh, Longstreet, James Longstreet, the major general who is uh, the main lieutenant of General Lee, is going to show up. And he's going to banter with them about Darwin and other things. And then in a part of the clip that we're not going to see, he will call Pickett over to the side and tell Pickett about the charge that he is going to be ordered to make. So that's the circumstances of this clip. You know, hearing you talk about monkeys and trees, I'm remembered of a time during a cannonade on the peninsula when there was just one tree for the men to hide behind, and it was a, a skinny little tree, and the, the boys that just fell in behind in a long, thin line which moved just like a pigtail. It would sway to one side and then to the other. If a shell came this way, the line would sway that way. <laughs> if a ball come that way, the line would sway back this way. It was a hell of a thing to see. George, what has that got to do with what we're talking about? Down, gentlemen. Don't let me interrupt the revival. General, you're just in time. <laughs> I have been trying to persuade George here of the modern scientific theories of Charles Darwin, the theory of evolution, the notion that all mankind has descended from the ape. He does not subscribe. That's so. I do not. And I've ordered General Armstead to cease filling his head with such heathen blasphemies. Henceforth, sir, you are to devote your reflective moments to studying matters of military significance. Ordered me. Or perhaps uh, appropriating some of this fine Pennsylvania whiskey here? Absolutely. Uh, General, would you care for... No, thank you, Jim. Uh, surely the commanding general shares my deep feelings of disgust at this simian suggestion. Uh, well, George, I suppose there's some pretty smart folk that take Darwin for the gospel. They will not be invited to join George's ever-shrinking circle of friends. General Longstreet, sir. I intend to lay this matter to rest for once and for all time. Oh, good. Sirs, perhaps there are those among you who do believe that you are descended from an ape. I suppose it is even possible there are those among you who believe that I am descended from an ape. But I challenge the man to step forward who believes that General Robert E. Lee is descended from an ape. You're yeah, here. Yeah. Not likely. <laughs> George, all science trembles before the searing logic of your fire inlet. Uh. So exactly how many of your relatives are there that are apes? And in just that quip, which is funny, and it's the kind of thing that Pickett would say, I think that this writer, um, Michael Shara, 
uh, gets it right. Of course, of course. That's what's brilliant about it. It fits dramatically. No, that, that, absolutely. I mean, it, it fits dramatically into the scene and the time because this is the kind of thing that people like this would say, even if the words that they're using have been uh, taken out of, uh, are an astron uh, anachronistically used. Can I just comment on that? It kind of goes to both what you said and your response to it, which is it fits very well with the other premise that you're making about, you know, don't say anything that makes me have to think. <laughs> That's why he wants to shut it down, because it's a challenge to his pre-existing mode of thinking. There's a to order. It's a challenge to authority. Right. Well, that's one well, of the, the same thing. In this case. That, that's one of the problems the order that is established by shutting down the thinking. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the uh, ironies of war. I mean, those three brigade uh, commanders are going to be killed and severely wounded, uh, following orders which they know are uh, fatal, uh, and they do not have the right to think uh, under military circumstances, sir. Well, I, I, I'm looking at it a little differently. They're sitting around a campfire right. at night, right. drinking whiskey, right. and they're just arguing back and forth. They're having and, a good and, time. And Rand doesn't, they're all friends anyway. That's Rand, right. Rand doesn't, doesn't come in there, and they're, they're, they're trying to poke at each other as much as they can. Yeah, that's why it's brilliant, because it works as drama, as film, uh, and it doesn't tell you what they ever could have literally said. It tells you everything that they believed, I think. And one of the nice things about the portrayal of Longstreet here is you notice that he doesn't like thinking at all. He just says, uh, uh, and he was like that. He was a brilliant military man uh, who himself admitted that he was incapable of intellectual thought. And uh, he, of course, um, survived the war and became a Republican uh, and ran for office in the North and was vilified throughout the South because he evolved. No, that's because Lincoln was the first Republican. Right. And we are, okay. So, well, thank you. That was very well responded to you. You listened to it very well. Now, for a special treat, we're going to have a consequence of my own ignorance because the other clip that I wanted to play for you. Let's see here. Um, the conversation between these two men. This is Car Colonel Joshua Chamberlain uh, from Maine. And uh, this is the night before he is going to defend Little Round Top. And in many people's idea of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, he's going to save the day by keeping the uh, left flank from being rolled up by uh, Longstreet's attack uh, around the left flank of the uh, Union position, which is what he wanted to try to persuade Lee to do with the whole army, not to confront them directly, not to go up against uh, the heights in the center of the battlefield, but in fact to flank the Union Army to force them out of their high position so that they could meet him on better ground. Anyway, so uh, he is the guy who uh, historians disagree somewhat about uh, uh, the importance of what he did. But in the movie, he is critical to the saving of the Battle of Gettysburg and to the saving of the Union cause. Okay, here he is speaking with um, Kilrain, his sergeant, his uh, intimate, uh, the man he has as his adjunct. Uh, adjunct. Um, okay, I tried to download this too, and I had the same software. I couldn't get it to work a second time. Okay, I, I tried and I tried, and I got online and I couldn't get it to work. So, <laughs> he, 
Instead, we've got something better. We've got two people over here of the Bolt family who are going to read the dialogue. And whoops, did I, do, ooh, did I turn it off? What did I do? OK, I want to get that. Yeah, OK, there they are. Look at these two guys while they're reading. And um, the older Bolt over here is going to be playing the Irish sergeant because he can speak with a kind of Irish accent. And uh, <laughs> his, yes. okay. and his uh, son, Adam Bolt, is going to be playing the role of Joshua Chamberlain. Um, jo uh, Adam right now is wearing the uniform of a private because he is in a reenactment uh, regiment. And uh, I have him here playing a colonel. So you're going to have to do a little imaginative thinking here to see this private as a... Uh, so here they are. Uh, Kill Rain, a Kill Rain is a fictional character. Joshua Chamberlain is not. Yeah. Okay, so come on up here and read it in. And one of the reasons why it's okay that we're doing this is this is a talking head scene. In the other one, people walk around and point at things and make jokes. These two guys are just two talking heads for the whole scene. So that's kind of what we got here, two talking heads. Okay, here they are, all lit up. Tell me something, Buster. What do you think of Negroes? Well, if you mean the race, I don't really know. This is not a thing to be ashamed of. The thing is, you cannot judge a race. Any man who judges by the group of his peewit, you take men one at a time. To me, there was never any difference. None at all? No, uh, not at all. Of course, I haven't known that many free men, but those I knew in Bangor, Portland, you, you look in the eye, there was a man. There was a divine spark, as my mother used to call it. Then, that is all there is to it. Races are men. What a piece of work is man. How infinite in faculties, in form and moving. How express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. Well, if he's an angel, all right to them. But he down well must be a killer angel. Colonel Darling, you're a lovely man. I see a great vast difference between us, yet I admire you, lad. You're an idealist, praise be. The truth is, Colonel, there is no divine spark. There is many a man alive no more of value than a dead dog. Believe me, when you've seen them hang, each one the way I have back in the old country. Equality, what I'm fighting for is the right to prove I'm a better man than many of them. Where have you seen this divine spark in operation, Colonel? Where have you noted his magnificent equality? Two things of earth are equal and have an equal chance. Not a, a leaf, not a tree. There's many a man worse than me and some better. But I don't think a race or country matters a damn. What matters, Colonel, is justice. Which is why I'm here. I'll be treated as I deserve, not as a, my father deserved, and Kilrain, and I damn all gentlemen. There is only one aristocracy, and that is right here. And that's why we have got to win this war. Okay, one thing. Say those last two lines again, and touch your head when you're saying the only aristocracy is right here, because that's a critical gesture that Kilrain makes. Okay, say take two. Take two, right, okay. <laughs> He's got to get it right. I mean, it's only his first time. <laughs> yeah, do it in Irish, uh, but uh, get those last two sentences again. I am Kilrain, and I damn all gentlemen. There's only one aristocracy, and that is right here. And that's why we've got to win this war. <laughs> See, anyone in this audience could get up and give a talk. I mean, it's amazing, the talent <laughs> that's here. Okay, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, okay. 
<laughs> okay, well, what did you think of that? It's an Academy Award, right? Yeah, but he's got a new career on his hands. <laughs> the two guys, yeah. It was, I actually uh, got online and tried to learn how to do an Irish accent. Uh, there was a guy who had a class on how to do Irish accents. <laughs> and I, I practiced and practiced, but I didn't get any good. And when I found out just today that Eric could do it, uh, he was the man. All right. <laughs> okay, well. My take on this is that it's brilliant because what it shows you, especially in what Kilrain does, is a man thinking. That's all. Careful, he's a southern. Well, he's Irish. Ah. He's Irish. Yeah. So inherently a northerner. What's that? Because Ireland's in the north. Ireland's. <laughs> you look like you might have some <laughs> genetic <laughs> connection with the. Uh, you don't have any Irish? <laughs> All right. And I, it, it's a brilliant dialogue. Uh, it's well worth reading the novel again just to read it because it certainly is not showing him the voice of abolition or uh, any kind of Lincoln-esque character. He's thinking like an Irish working class man, uh, but very powerfully and uh, brilliantly uh, set up dramatically in the novel and in the movie. Well, I think in a lot of respects you've got uh, the, the colonel there, who is a professor. Right. That's what he's paid to do, is to think and to bring forth ideas. Kill Rain, on the other hand, shows that you don't have to be an intellectual giant to figure this stuff out. You don't have to be <laughs> an aristocrat or a, or a pro uh, professor or educated. He sought this out on his own level of experiences he's had on the past. Yeah, that, that's exactly right, um, and that's why I think it is completely a brilliant piece of theater for uh, whether it ever could happen or not. Uh, in fact, it, it certainly represents something very important about the process. Now, there's a man here who uh, has had a career teaching forensic biology. Forensic science. He's the guy that's behind all those cop shows that you are all addicted to. Okay. <laughs> Without him, none of them could take place. He said that uh, he has some thoughts about Darwin and forensic science that he would like to share with us. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephen Gilbert. Uh, I uh, in forensic science about 30 some odd years. I taught in the colleges for 30 years, at universities. When I read the synopsis of this about Darwin and the species and the races and the similarities and differences, um, a, a forensic research project just came right to mind. And Darwin was part of that. Uh, way back when, when Darwin was working on all things, he, uh, he contacted his first cousin. His first cousin was uh, Sir uh, Francis Galton, who was a, uh, a researcher. And uh, Galton, like he was a eugenicist, he was the person who coined the phrase eugenics about the better person, the more perfect person. And Darwin, for some reason, instead of doing it himself, he got to his cousin and says, look, you know, Here's this idea. What about these, these, these fingerprints? Back then, at that time, fingerprints were very rarely addressed about when you talk about identification. It wasn't until the early 1900s when fingerprints really started to take over from other alternative means. So he said, What about these fingerprints? You know, all different kinds of different patterns in our fingers. I wonder if we'll have the same ones. And they discussed and came up with this research question. The question was, well, Negroes, Jews, affluent people, poor people, politicians, all these people, older, younger, do they have unique patterns to that group? Well, today you think, well, that's stupid. We all have the same kind of friends, but if they didn't ask the question, we may not know that today. So Galton said, okay. I'm going to this. So he took 40,000 40, fingerprints 
40,000. And he cross-referenced 40,000 fingerprints. And I'll try to figure that out, how long that took him. And he came up with a couple of very interesting conclusions, which we believe today. It's never changed. And the first, the first conclusion was that none of those groups, despite who you are, what you do for a living, your age, your sex, your race, whatever, we all have the same seven patterns. You may not have all on your seven patterns on your fingers, but there are only seven patterns, and we all share the same patterns. But they look differently because of genetic and biological changes, which is a whole bunch of different story. That was the first conclusion that we came up with, that the rich guy and the poor guy had the same kind of patterns, and the Negroes and the, the Caucasian the same kind of patterns, just different different placement, distribution of the fingers. The next conclusion he came up with, which is the most important conclusion he came up with, and it's all because of Darwin, he came up with the conclusion that there will never be two identical prints. And people say, well, why not? Well, identical twins don't have identical prints. And no one can really have explain that. Uh, we know that your prints change in the womb from your mother causes some some change in the prints, makes them unique. So his his final conclusion was with a statistical probability of one in sixty some odd billion, there'll never be another white print. Well so now, if you ask someone about that, they'll say, I'll never be another white print. Well, my personal opinion is if you have a probability, that means there's a possibility. And so, uh, we've never examined old prints in the past, old prints today, old prints tomorrow. So maybe it's possible, but 60, 60 billion is about more than the population of the Earth. So anyway, all this came around because Darwin was thinking about the same exact things you were talking about, the differences in races and people and what you did, your environment. And he just gave us little stories of Dalton, and he goes at the end of it. And he wrote a book. It was, it was published in 1892. And, yeah, 1892. And it's, it's, it's the, the treatise called Fingerprints, which now everyone in the fingerprint technology in forensic science will tell you those conclusions. They don't tell you the golf, but they'll tell you the probabilities against the matches, the fact that there's no other two fingerprints the same, all came from uh, Darwin. I'll just take a photo of that. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are wonderful people who have come today and talked and been a part of this, and I personally thank you very much. Be safe on your drive home. <laughs>